So let's now go ahead and talk about another facet of our expression tree processing app case study. And in this case, we're going to talk about the functional and non-functional requirements. And the, the reason for doing this is first to explain to you what the program really does. But more importantly, it's to underscore the fact that when we apply patterns to guide our design and our implementation, we do this not just because we're trying to show off all the patterns that we know, but because we're actually trying to address functional and non-functional requirements. So don't just apply patterns to apply patterns, apply them to solve problems. Okay, so what are functional and non-functional requirements? If you, if slash when you take a software engineering course, you'll learn a lot about requirements analysis, and you'll see that there's generally two categories of requirements. There's functional requirements, which says, what should the system do? What is the behavior that it's trying to perform? And uh, you know that's obviously very important to users. People want to know, do I use this thing to do electronic financial trading? Do I use are my requirements here to um, analyze data sets to look for patterns in genetic sequences? Am I doing something that's allowing me to do word processing? You know, what are the functional requirements? So that's one important type of requirement. The second type of requirement category are the so-called non-functional requirements, which is actually a pretty funny name because non-functional sounds like it doesn't work, right? If you say, I have a non-functional car, <laughs> oh, your, your car doesn't run. Well, we don't mean doesn't run. We mean things that are more than functional. So sometimes people talk about this as parafunctional, which sounds like paranormal. Um, or they often talk about these as quality attributes or systemic requirements. I like the term quality attribute quite a bit. And quality attributes or so-called non-functional requirements say not just what the system does, but how does it do it? So is it going to be efficient? Is it going to be scalable? Is it going to be dependable? Is it going to be secure? Is it going to be um, is it going to be predictable? Is it going to be modular? Is it going to be extensible? And sometimes we call these the illities. So like um, extensibility or uh, reusability or maintainability. So you'll hear people use the word illity a lot. And um, basically what we're saying here is that this is sort of the qualities of the system, not just its behavior. And I'm sure you've all had experiences with software that may be very interesting in terms of what it does, but it, it crashes a lot or it's really slow or if you're trying to use it in another program, it's tightly coupled and therefore hard to reuse. Those are all examples of problems with the non-functional requirements as opposed to the functional requirements. So the functional requirements for our program is to have it operate into two modes. One mode is the so-called succinct mode. And in that mode, it's basically just like a calculator where you give it some input expression and it gives you a result. And of course, the input expression that you give it has to match the, the grammar of arithmetic expressions, which you see here described using something called bacchus nauer format. Um, but there's also different ways of doing this. So there's a GUI version running on Android where you have a user interface that, that looks like this, in fact, is this. And then you can go ahead and click buttons and it'll tell you what the input expression is. And then when you hit enter, it'll give you the result. And then there's also a command line version that runs in C Lion or runs on the command line. And in that case, you can type the expressions in in various notations, most commonly in infix notation. So you can see here I could enter, I could type in minus five times the quantity three plus four, and my command line version spits out minus 35, which of course is the right answer. As you can see, these infix expressions can contain parenthesized sub-expressions to some arbitrary nesting depth. There's also another mode, another set of requirements called verbose mode. And in verbose mode, the program prompts the user to enter in various commands. And these commands have to follow a certain protocol, but what they allow you to do is they allow you to say, here is the input format that the expressions will be given. They'll be an infix, postfix, and so on. After you do that, then you can give the expression. You can type the expert command and you can give the expression that you want to use. 
which would then be like, you know, minus five times three plus four. You can set variables that can be used in an expression. So you can say A equals five and B equals three and C equals four. And then you can write your expressions in terms of variables rather than numbers. You can print the contents of the expression tree that you've entered via your expression in in order, post order, pre order, level order, traversal order. And then you can also evaluate the value of the current in, uh, input expression. So if you made a tree for a certain expression like minus five times three plus four, you can say, please evaluate what it is and it'll come back and give you a result in whatever order you ask it to do. And then finally, you can go ahead and quit the program. So you can say, I'm done, I'm gonna bail out. Verbose mode is also accessible in a GUI way using Android or on a command line interface where you can go ahead and give it directives like I want to format to be in order. Here's an expression given using in order format. Go ahead and print this, go ahead and evaluate it and so on and so forth. So we're gonna be largely focusing on the command line versions of this stuff because that's what we have for C++. But just to show the diversity of patterns, there's also a GUI version written in Java that basically implements the same functionality, just exposes it in a different way. So those are the functional requirements. Then there's also a whole pile of non-functional requirements. And basically the, the gist of the non-functional requirements is to make it easier to simplify the extensibility and portability, and of course, reusability and maintainability, all these other illities of our software. And by doing it using patterns and, and objects and so on, it makes it a lot easier to evolve and maintain the code. Now, one of the things that sometimes throws people for a loop when they're first exposed to this is they say, I could write an expression tree processing program in you know, 100 lines of code in C, and it would do the job just fine. And why, is, why isn't that sufficient? And of course, the, the answer is, we're, we're trying to show off these patterns for a, a broader purpose so you can learn how to build more interesting programs than expression tree programs. And we're just using this as a, a means to show these things in a reasonably um, well-bounded form factor. But even in the context of our humble but lovable expression tree case study, it's still valuable to think about how you would extend it and evolve it over time. And uh, if we were taking this class in the 14-week version, you'd get a chance to really try that in practice, and you'd have an assignment where you'd take the code and evolve it and extend it. Because we're doing it in a month as opposed to three months, we don't have enough time to do that here, which is why we're doing other ways of using patterns in assignment number five. But rest assured, if you were to actually go ahead and try this for the, the bigger project, you would quickly see that understanding the patterns makes it really easy to make changes. Whereas if you hacked something up with uh, C code and 100 lines of code, it might work, but you'd be hard pressed to evolve it in any sensible way. And I'll actually show you some examples of that to make it more clear. So what do we really mean? What does it mean to extend things? How does that relate to non-functional properties? Well, one thing we'd like to be able to do is we'd like to be able to take our expression tree and we'd like to be able to add new operations on it without making any changes to the design or the implementation of the existing tree structure. So we wanna be able to keep things exactly as they are and add new capabilities. That's hard to do with your hacked up 100 lines of C code. Um, so here's some examples. We wanna be able to have all kinds of different ways to print the order of the expression tree to meet those requirements. We wanna be able to have different ways of computing the value of the expression tree, doing things like post-order traversal and stack-based evaluation. We'll talk more about that later. You might also wanna do more advanced things. You might want to do semantic analysis or optimization or code generation. And these are all examples of things that you would do if you actually applied the patterns and C++ language features to write a language processing tool like a compiler or an optimizer or a, an IDE like CLion or IntelliJ and so on. And of course, another thing we wanna be able to do is we wanna be able to keep the same code base largely unchanged and be able to have it run in different environments. So have it be able to run in a command line environment, have it run in a user interface, graphic user interface environment, and keep the code base as common as possible. 
Now, for this example with C++, we'd have some additional work to integrate it into a uh, GUI environment. We just have to go out and pick a C++ GUI framework or else integrate it with Java using Java native interface calls. With the Java version of the code, there's also a Java version of all this stuff, then it really is the case that there's a common code base for the GUI version on Android and the command line version on the regular Java platform or the regular Java console. And the code reuse is like 99%, it's great. So let's kind of put all the pieces together here. The purpose of this case study is to show how to apply gang of four patterns in something more concrete than just talking about them in the abstract. And it's also about showing how the patterns fit together. So in addition to talking about the patterns in isolation, which of course are important, we're also gonna talk about relationships between the patterns. And that's a sort of a second level black belt approach to understanding software design. The case study itself is about 6,000 lines of code and about 60 or so classes, depends how you count them. And you can find all the code here. So this is by no means, uh, this isn't a million lines of code or 10 million lines of code, but it's also something more than you could sort of just hack up over uh, a weekend. It, it has some serious thought put into it. And what's cool is that patterns help to justify and document all the pieces that we use here. Again, there's a command line version here in C++, and there's also an Android Java version that's GUI, and there's also a, a Java version that's, that's built in uh, for command line use as well.